May 10, 2024, News Report 1. On May 6, the State Council Office issued this year's Legislative Work Plan, planning to submit the Private Economy Promotion Law for review by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. In February, the head of the Ministry of Justice stated that the drafting work of the Private Economy Promotion Law has been initiated. The law will focus on the core concerns of private enterprises, including protecting the property rights and interests of private enterprises and entrepreneurs, promoting fair participation in market competition, equal use of production factors, and addressing the issue of overdue payments to small and medium-sized enterprises. Facing the sluggish Chinese economy, the private economy has become a means to salvage the economy. However, the Communist Party of China's determination to solve the problems of private enterprises is being questioned. Taking the private education promotion law as an example, after the law was enacted, private education almost disappeared within six years. Therefore, it is difficult to predict whether the private economy promotion law will encounter the same fate. In the annual legislative work plan, the Chinese government proposed 21 laws to be formulated or revised for the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress to review, with 30 administrative regulations planned for revision. Among them, particular attention is being paid to the formulation of the Regulations on Network Data Security Management. Although China already has the Cybersecurity Law, and the data security law, a new regulation is being drafted to strengthen the management of network data security. The other two important projects are the drafting of a law to deal with sudden public health incidents and the strengthening of foreign-related legal construction, including the arbitration law, the anti-money laundering law, and the maritime law. News Report 2 the USS Halsey destroyer of the U.S. 7th Fleet entered the waters of the Shisha Islands in the South China Sea on May 10. This is the first time in half a year that a U.S. warship has entered the waters of the Shisha Islands. After passing through the Taiwan Strait on May 8, the Halsey sailed south for two days before entering the waters of the Shisha Islands. The Seventh Fleet issued a press release stating that the Halsey was conducting freedom of navigation operations in the waters of the Shisha Islands in accordance with international law. After the operation, the Halsey has left the waters of the Shisha Islands and continued its operations in the South China Sea. The Seventh Fleet also pointed out that the waters of the Shisha Islands are international waters, and all ships are free to pass through. This operation defended the rights of all countries and challenged China's claim to the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. Additionally, the Global Times reported that Chinese warships recently formed a formation to conduct training in the South China Sea. The training includes tasks such as maritime air defense and anti-submarine warfare, aimed at enhancing the formation's combat and coordinated operational capabilities. This formation includes the missile destroyer Junyi, the patrol vessel Kunming, and the frigate Xianning. It is worth mentioning that this training of Chinese warships to the South China Sea is happening during the annual military exercises between the United States and the Philippines. The exercises reportedly include tasks such as recapturing islands and controlling territories. It is widely believed that this training of the Chinese Navy formation is in response to the U.S.-Philippine exercises, demonstrating China's firm stance. News Report 3 The federal court in New York sentenced Qin Hui, the actual controller of New American Holdings, to seven months in prison on May 8. This period coincides with Qin Hui's arrest in October 2023. After the sentencing, Qin Hui was taken directly to the airport to be imprisoned. Qin Hui was charged with donating political cash in his own name, immigration fraud, and forging documents. In March of this year, Qin Hui admitted to these crimes. In 2019, he fraudulently applied for a driver's license in Florida and used false data to apply for permanent residency in the United States. Prosecutor Pease stated that Qin Hui disregarded American politics and immigration systems, and his fraudulent behavior resulted in a heavy sentence and deportation. Qin Hui's lawyer stated that Qin Hui has left the United States, but did not disclose his whereabouts. 
Chin Hui once made it to Forbes billionaire list, with an estimated $1.8 billion in assets from New American Holdings, including properties in Manhattan and Long Island. News Report 4 According to the Associated Press, a Chinese man posted a video on Billy Billy on March 26, showing that he used a drone to film the situation of the Japanese helicopter carrier Izumo, berthed at the Higashiku base in Japan. Kyoto News found this Chinese man who shot the video, but he refused to disclose his identity. The man said that he personally operated the drone to shoot the video, and the filming process was not interfered with. After shooting, he left Japan and is currently in China. He stated that he is not a military fanatic or a radical patriot and has no intention of criticizing the self-defense forces or provoking international conflicts. Regarding the video of the Kizumo, he apologized and admitted to breaking the law, and stated that he will not do it again in the future. Japanese Defense Minister Mu Yuanren stated at a press conference on May 10 that the incident of a drone filming the Izumo was very serious and that security capabilities of self-defense force facilities will be strengthened. Regarding the claim by the Chinese man that there was no interference, Mu Yuanren said that this is a detail of base security and is difficult to answer. He announced countermeasures, including the early introduction of stronger drone countermeasures and equipment, and the adoption of strict and rapid countermeasures within the legal framework, such as forcing drones to land. Additionally, the Japanese Senate passed a Defense Ministry Establishment Law Amendment on May 10, which includes the establishment of a Joint Operations Command. This command will command the three branches of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, Army, Navy, and Air Force, as well as all military forces in Japan, including those in new security fields such as networks and space. The U.S. is currently considering strengthening the functions of its headquarters in Japan to enhance interoperability between U.S. and Japanese forces to address security challenges posed by China and North Korea. The new Joint Operations Command will consist of 240 personnel, led by a Joint Operations Commander with the same rank as the Chief of Staff of each Self-Defense Force. This means that part of the functions of the Joint Staff Chief will be given to the Joint Operations Commander. The Defense Ministry Establishment Law Amendment was approved by the Japanese House of Representatives last month and now only needs to be signed to take effect and implement this new mechanism. News Report 5 Bloomberg reported that major British companies such as HSBC Holdings and Standard Chartered Bank are exerting pressure on UK Prime Minister Sunak to relax restrictions on Chinese operations under the national security law. The British Parliament passed the national security law in 2023, requiring the government to establish a foreign influence registration system, requiring British companies to declare and publicly disclose transaction information with different countries based on their risk levels to increase transaction transparency. Due to tensions in UK-China relations, British officials are considering categorizing China as the most strict level, which would require British companies to declare and disclose transaction information when trading with China. British companies are concerned that if the UK categorizes China as the most stringent level, it will lead to retaliatory measures from China. British Foreign Secretary Cameron stated on May 9 that the national security law is very good legislation. British government officials revealed that the lobbying efforts of British companies may be ineffective, and the government may enact stricter laws. According to a survey by the British Chamber of Commerce in China, this year, 32,000 British companies in China employed 60,000 people and generated £115.1 billion in revenue. News Report 6 According to Bloomberg, the European Chamber of Commerce in China released a survey result on May 10, which showed that among European companies in China, only 13% consider China as their preferred investment destination, the lowest level in history. The proportion of companies that found it difficult to do business in China last year reached 66%, the highest level since 2014. The survey also found that 42% of companies are considering expanding in China, 40% of companies have already or are considering relocating their business out of China, 
with Southeast Asia as the preferred destination, followed by Europe, India, and North America. In addition, 33% of companies believe that there is overcapacity in China, with the construction and automotive industries being particularly prominent. Furthermore, 55% of companies believe that the Chinese economy will slow down this year and pose challenges to their business, with 50% of companies preparing to cut costs in China, including 25% of companies planning layoffs. The European Chamber of Commerce in China survey report pointed out that the attractiveness of China as an investment destination is disappearing, and European companies will continue to seek opportunities in other markets if China's business environment does not substantially improve. News Report 7 BBC reported that a survey released by the Election Study Center of National Chengchi University in Taiwan showed that 33% of Taiwanese people believe that the status quo across the Taiwan Strait should be maintained forever, the highest percentage in 94 years. The survey also showed the Taiwanese people's views on the future direction, with 1.2% supporting early reunification, 3.3% supporting early independence, 6.2% favoring reunification with a lean toward the status quo, 21% favoring independence with a lean toward the status quo, and 27% favoring deciding the status quo again. The percentage of people who want to maintain the status quo, either leaning toward reunification or independence, exceeds 80%. Changes in the political environment may be related to these results. Yu Qingxin, a researcher at the Election Study Center of National Chengchi University in Taiwan, said that maintaining the status quo forever means relative non-openness, similar to a one-way street, with no other options. However, the difference between maintaining the status quo forever and independence is that the national title will not be changed, and the national title of the Republic of China will continue to be used. Wang Hanzhen, a professor at the University of Nevada, Taiwan, said that the distance between the Taiwanese people and China is growing, but the Kuomintang and the Democratic Progressive Party have failed to lead Taiwan out of the status quo. Taiwanese people currently live in a relatively stable environment, are satisfied with their quality of life, and are therefore willing to maintain the status quo. However, there are risks because Taiwanese people are relatively insensitive to risks. They are the democratic rich second generation. News Report 8 According to the United Daily News, President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan will grant a special pardon to former President Chen Shui-bian next week. Tsai Ing-wen has reached a consensus with President-elect Lai ching tae who has always advocated for the pardon of Chen Shui-bian. Chen Shui-bian has been applying for medical parole due to illness and has been serving a sentence since 2009, totaling six years. The report states that Tsai Ing-wen's pardon will exempt Chen Shui-bian from his sentence but not from his conviction, and he will still need to return the illegally obtained 800 million new Taiwan dollars. The spokesperson for the office of the President of Taiwan did not directly respond to the pardon rumors, only stating that they will ensure that Chen Shui-bian receives proper health care and handle other matters according to the law. Wu Zongxian, a legislator from the Kuomintang and convener of the Party Caucus and the Judiciary and Organic Laws and Statutes Committee, announced that he will invite the head of the Judicial Yuan's Ministry of Justice to a hearing on May 15 to clarify the handling of the Chen Shui-bian case and the disposition of his illegal gains. News Report 9 According to the United Daily News, Meng Hongkai, secretary of the Kuomintang Legislative Caucus, stated on May 10 that Kuomintang legislators will not attend the inauguration ceremony of President Lai Ching Tee on May 20. Meng Hongkai pointed out that May 20 is a Monday, and the Legislative Yuan has committee meetings scheduled, so Kuomintang legislators will be in the Legislative Yuan that day. Kuomintang Chairman Zhu Liluan also stated that he has not received an invitation to the presidential inauguration ceremony and will decide whether to attend after receiving the invitation. Meanwhile, Ko Wen Jie, chairman of the Taiwan People's Party, stated that he will attend the president's inauguration ceremony because he has always advocated for party reconciliation and social harmony and will not be absent. 
This event shows that the Kuomintang is doing something that the Chinese Communist Party cannot do, which is to help the CCP disrupt the inauguration ceremony of the President of the Republic of China. News Report 10 According to the United Daily News, the application by the residents of Matsu, Taiwan, for the Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card in Fujian Province, China, has been accused of violating cross-strait regulations. The Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card is equivalent to a transit card that can be used in Fujian for discounts on buses, attractions, etc. The practice of the Matsu County government representatives facilitating residents to apply for the Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card in Fujian has been accused of violating cross-strait regulations. The Matsu County government not only promoted the Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card but also arranged for counters to handle applications, collecting residents' information and handing it over to the Fujian side for card production. According to a Matsu County councillor, more than 3,000 people have applied, equivalent to everyone except the elderly, children, and civil servants. DPP legislator Lin Chuying posted on Facebook that the Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card is a tool of China's united front work, and personal information falling into China's hands will be tracked for consumption records and movement trajectories, violating cross-strait regulations and posing national security issues. Zhang Jihong, deputy head of the Mainland Affairs Council, stated that they have persuaded the Matsu County government to stop handling the Fuma Tongcheng Tongka card. News Report 11 According to the United Daily News, China's new ambassador to India, Su Feihong, arrived in New Delhi on May 10. The position of Chinese ambassador to India has been vacant for a year and a half, the longest since China and India resumed the exchange of ambassadors in 1976. Since the spring of 2020, the Chinese and Indian armies have been in a standoff along the border, leading to tense relations between the two countries. China's former ambassador to India, Sun Weidong, left office in October 2020 and returned to the foreign ministry, where he is currently a vice minister, a position that has been vacant. Indian Foreign Minister S. Jaishankar stated in March this year that it is necessary for India and China to restore border stability to push forward the development of bilateral relations. Su Feihong said in an interview with CGTN that China and India are partners, not competitors. According to public information, Su Feihong, 60, has served as the deputy director of the European Department of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, the Chinese ambassador to Afghanistan, and the Chinese ambassador to Romania. Since 2021, he has served as the assistant minister of foreign affairs, in charge of financial and administrative affairs. Indian media said that Su Feihong is experienced in diplomacy but is not familiar with India.